Hi, this is Cameron. I'm going to be following after Brian, who just described some of the general characteristics of the Lutheran system. I'm going to go over some of the history of the Lutheran system, as well as describe some of the common antigens. I'm going to go over some of the allo antibodies, as well as their clinical significance, and some of their in vitro effects as well. And finally, I'm going to discuss the inheritance of the Lutheran A negative, B negative phenotype. To start with, in 1945, anti-Lutheran A was first found in a patient with lupus erythematosus following a blood transfusion of theirs. The new antibody was named after the donor on whose blood this low prevalence antigen was found. Unfortunately, due to an incorrect label, instead of calling the blood group Lutheran, it was called Lutheran instead, which has stuck with it for now. It's a shining example of why we need to be a little careful about how we label our tubes and whatnot. Not all of the Lutheran antibodies were discovered all at once. Anti-Lutheran A was, of course, discovered in 1945, but it took a couple of years before they discovered anti-Lutheran B, which was evidence for uh, the A antigen's antithetical partner. After this, they learned about the Lutheran A and B negative phenotype, and these individuals would occasionally make this anti-Lutheran-3 antibody as well, and this was discovered in 1963. Um, subsequently, they also discovered about 22 other antigens that were associated with the Lutheran system altogether. The most common Lutheran antigens include Lutheran antigen A and B. Lutheran antigen A is a fairly low frequency antigen 8% of whites and 5% of blacks, respectively, are going to be Lutheran A positive. And because antibodies to the Lutheran A antigen are sometimes reactive at 37 degrees Celsius, they can sometimes be clinically significant and they may cause some mild HDFN. The other common Lutheran antigen is Lutheran antigen B. It's a fairly high frequency antigen in 99.8% of the population. Antibodies to this antigen are always clinically significant, as most examples are going to be IgG and reactive at 37 degrees Celsius. Uh, these antibodies can cause hemolytic transfusion reactions and some mild HDFN as well. One thing of note, is that the A and B antigens in the Lutheran system are codominant. And as you can see in the chart, there are quite a few more individuals who are uh, Lutheran B positive rather than Lutheran A positive. Although it's far rarer for people to be both A and B negative. Now with regard to the Lutheran 3 antigen. The Lutheran 3 antigen is associated with the Lutheran A and B antigens on the red blood cell. So individuals who are Lutheran A and B negative who have no Lutheran antigens on their red blood cells are susceptible to making an antibody against this L3, uh, Lutheran 3 antigen. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of information on the anti-Lutheran 3 antibody. So information about its clinical significance, for example, uh, just isn't available right now. With regard to anti-Lutheran A, uh, most of anti-Lutheran A is going to be IgM, and it's going to react a lot better at room temperature. Some examples of anti-Lutheran A are capable of binding complement uh, more importantly, there are some examples that react at 37 degrees Celsius, and these are the ones that are going to be clinically significant. There may be few examples of them, but 
when they are there, they can be recognized by a characteristic loose mixed field reactivity in the test tube, which is very handy for identifying this uh, alloantibody. With regard to uh, anti-Lutheran B, although some of the first examples of this alloantibody were IgM and IgA, most examples of alloantilutherin B are going to be IgG, and they are going to be reactive at 37 degrees Celsius. And because of this, uh, antilutherin B is always clinically significant. There is some interesting dosage effect going on with the antilutherin B, though, as Lutheran A and B positive individuals are going to have a weaker reaction with the uh, alloantibody than individuals who are only Lutheran B positive. Now with this anti-Lutheran 3, again, only individuals who are Lutheran A and B negative and who don't express the Lutheran antigens on their red blood cells are going to make this antibody. It's an extremely rare antibody. It looks a lot like inseparable anti Lutheran A, B, because of its association with the A and B antigens. Um, it's going to react with all red blood cells except for Lutheran A and B negative phenotype. Um, it is reactive, um, or rather antiglobulin reactive, uh, but really there's not a lot of information about this antibody, and so its clinical significance still is not known. Now I'm going to discuss some of the inheritance modes of this Lutheran A and B negative phenotype. As I've mentioned before, there are some who inherit this phenotype who will make absolutely no Lutheran antigens on their red blood cells, but that is not the case for all of the people who inherit this phenotype. Uh, the most common inheritance is the dominant type, Lutheran A and B negative phenotype. Um, and for example, these do have some few antigens on their red blood cells. Uh, so going into this dominant type, uh, the gene responsible is not on the Lutheran locus. It's actually uh, a gene KLF1, and a mutation at this allele is responsible for uh, only trace amounts of Lutheran antigens being found on these individuals' red blood cells. Uh, an individual might inherit some Lutheran B from uh, the Lutheran gene, but regular typing, they'll show up as uh, A and B negative. But if you use more advanced techniques like absorption and elution, you'll find that their red blood cells will actually react with the anti-Lutheran B after all. Another interesting effect from this uh, KLF1 mutation is that other uh, antigens from other systems will also be affected. That includes P1 and I antigens, as well as a few others. It's uh, worth recognizing that because these individuals do have Lutheran antigens on their blood cells, they are not going to be making uh, anti-LU3 or anti-Lutheran3 antibodies um, as the next group of inheritance patterns will. The next inheritance pattern is recessive type, and um, this happens at the Lutheran locus. So inheriting two silent alleles at this locus is going to result in a true null phenotype where there are no Lutheran antigens whatsoever. Uh, individuals with only a single silent allele are still going to produce antigens, and those are going to demonstrate dosage 
but those with two silent alleles are going to lack any antigens whatsoever, and they will be susceptible to making antibodies against uh, Lutheran antigens, and that includes anti-Lutheran 3, um, which, again, is a very rare antibody. This does not happen very often whatsoever. There is a third uh, inheritance pattern, which is recessive X-linked inhibitor type. And this is extremely rare. In fact, I only found maybe one large family in Australia uh, which was affected by this. Uh, and it was interesting because male family members who would type as uh, Lutheran A and B negative would be found to carry trace Lutheran B antigens. And uh, th these were detected using advanced techniques like adsorption and elution. Uh, and after some investigation, it was discovered that the X-linked gene GATA1 uh, was mutated in these individuals, and this somehow uh, decreased the antigens present on the red blood cells. And so somehow they still had some Lutheran B antigen on their red blood cells, despite uh, originally typing as Lutheran A and B negative. Uh, again, this was extremely rare in maybe one or two families at best, uh, but still an interesting case for the Lutheran system. And that concludes the Lutheran objectives. I hope you enjoyed these videos. Thanks for joining us.